Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the Editor-in-Chief of Talk House Film, and you're listening to the Talk House Film Podcast. If you're a regular reader of Talk House Film, as well as, of course, a subscriber to the Talk House Film Podcast, you'll know that Zach Clark is not only a talented indie director, but also one of the most engaging and cine-literate writers on film out there. He's also a huge fan of John Waters, so when the Pope of Trash himself was in town to promote the release of his newly restored second feature, Multiple Maniacs, I determined to get the two of them together in a room. Word on the street was that Waters had seen and liked Clark's 2013 film White Reindeer, information that only made this pairing all the more irresistible. For this conversation, the main focus was Multiple Maniacs. For those not fully up to speed, it's the film Waters made after Mondo Trasho and before Pink Flamingos, and it's a delightfully dark, debauched, and out there movie. Divine doesn't eat fresh feces in this one, but he does commit an act of cannibalism just before being raped by a freakishly large lobster. Since making his last film more than a decade ago, Waters has essentially become a professional wit and raconteur, so every time he sits down for a chat, you know you're going to get great stuff. To whet your appetite a little, some of the topics of this highly entertaining conversation include Waters' encounters with people as diverse as Reiner Werner Fassbinder and Justin Bieber, the theatrical stunts he used to pull to get publicity for his films, why he loves Terrence Malick's movies, even though he really shouldn't, his mother's reaction to seeing his first film, recent movies he and Clark have enjoyed, a great story from Clark about watching Pink Flamingos with his father when he was 14, and much more. So I went and saw uh, The Restoration a few weeks ago. You know, I've seen the movie many times on VHS before. Uh, and it's been a while since I'd sat down and actually wa- watched it. Me too. <laughs> um, and I was sort of initial, I was sort of struck by how much you can see time passing in the film. Well, that's, that's what makes um, it so bizarre you to know, see it today when, because it's you're watching it in a time capsule. Yeah, certainly. sure, sure. But also not just not just as a time capsule, but like literally when it starts, everyone's in like skirts and, you know, jackets and then there's snow on the ground right. by the end of the film. So I guess uh, I guess I'm a little curious if you if you could talk about sort of how you shot the film and did you shoot it in a row or did you take well we always or? shot in the fall and winter mm-hmm. and i just ignored the weather always sure, right sure. uh but you're right divine is walking through snow drifts and high heels in a one-piece woman's bathing suit so i would say that we shot that movie starting in the fall and finished it probably in january and we would shoot maybe once a week on weekends when when i could get it together to do it um i had the money to start but um, I, I think to get it all together and so everybody could shoot it. And I don't know why no one had real jobs that I can think of. I don't remember. Certainly Divine or David Lockery. Well, Divine was probably a hairdresser then, but he hated it. And uh, so I, I think that it was shot on weekends. or I, And how many days? I don't know. I would say maybe nine. All right. I knew what it was, but I did, no one had the full script the day we started, I don't think. And it was always handwritten. I, don't, I never had it, a typed version, I don't think, until the, the book came out and where I had to type it for, you know, for the screenplay. Uh, and did you have a full script when you started shooting, or did you no. were you writing as you went along? I think we were writing as we went along. I mean, I might have had the first half. I don't know. I found at Wesleyan Film Archive where all my stuff is, there's handwritten scripts, but sometimes in Mink's handwriting, like she copied it over, you have Xerox. I don't think they even had Xerox then. I think they had that kind of paper that you it was blue and it smelled. <laughs> I think maybe we used that. Um, and that's your apartment in the film? Oh, it's or? definitely my apartment, okay. yeah. Um, Divine's apartment was my apartment, yes. And then Pink Flamingo's The Marble House was my house. Because uh, the film really does, sort of looking at it now, also have this sort of home movie Of course it does. Yeah, it. It's, it's a, sort of maybe for all intents and purposes is a home movie? It is. Sure it is. It's the same way a kid today comes and makes a film on a cell phone. The problem was I wish I could have. The, the camera, that big giant yeah, 16 yeah. millimeter was heavy. So, um, yes, of course it was a home movie. The difference was that my friends seem were probably a little more extreme than other people's friends, but they weren't really like that. They were they, everybody was playing a part, except Mary Vivian Pierce did look exactly like that in real life. Mink did wear rosaries and black nail polish. She was pre goth. Divine never walked around in drag. He didn't ever do that. Divine wore I don't know one piece garbage outfits and stuff. <laughs> that that was his yeah, look yeah. out of out of it. Uh, and you also have people using their own names, too, I which know. I think is well, really interesting. Well, Bonnie was Mary Vivian Pierce's. That's what people call her in real life. Mary Vivian Pierce is her real name. You're right. I did use that. 
I don't know why, really. I don't know why. Because the parts were written for the people. Sure. Well, the, the Warhol stars were all using their own names. Yeah, but they were playing themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they were ad-libbing. They were... None of that was written. I mean, they gave him the suggestion of the story and stuff. But mine was... Um, I think I wanted the characters to be remembered. So if, you, if their name was Mink... And you are Mink. It just had a double chance because nobody knew who we were. Yeah, yeah. And what were you sort of watching at the time? I mean, All those obviously... movies you see on the yeah, wall. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... All the art movies, Yeah, like Bergman especially and all that. But at the same time, we would go to the Rex Theater, but Mary Vivian Pierce and I always did, to see the nudist camp movies, Doris Wishman, then the drive-in to see Herschel Gordon Lewis, and the art theaters to see not only the Bergman stuff, but the the Swedish stuff like I a woman and Therese and Isabella and Radley Metzger and all that kind of thing. So, and the black exploitation because Baltimore really had that. We, that's where they tested them. I, I mean, I always remember the premiere of slaves, a movie that Dionne Warwick was in. And that was the first premiere that I ever had in Baltimore. And she stepped out of the limo and somebody like, give me a bit, give me a dollar, bitch. Give me a dollar. <laughs> and I remember her face. <laughs> that was the perfect Baltimore premiere. Yeah. It struck me watching it. Uh, a couple weeks ago is this weird sort of world between H.G. Lewis, obviously the, the title and the gore and how sort of the cannibalism and stuff, but also a uh, 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 gospel according to St. Matthew. I love came that movie. Mind, Viridiana. You know? Viridiana. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. certainly Mother Joan and the Angels. When did that come out? That was another oh, Polish one about insane nuns. But, um, so all those movies that were about insane Catholicism, Benuel certainly always had that in it. So yeah, they were they were definitely, especially, and Kenneth Anger certainly did, had, had old Bible s movies in it. So um, yes, all those movies were definitely part of Pasolini. Uh, yeah, and you almost, there's... Your early stuff, uh, Mondo Trasho has sort of the miracle in the um, laundromat. laundromat yeah. um, and then uh, you really, I, I don't know that there's anything that Catholic until Pecker. Well, I thought with Multiple Maniacs that I had gotten Catholicism sure, sure, out of my system. Sure. Uh, let me think. You're right. Pecker is, yeah, the, the st living statue where she says full of grace. And all my friends that weren't Catholics thought she was saying full of grease because yeah, yeah. they never heard that expression. Uh, you're right, probably. And in Dir Dirty Shame, there kind of was because he was a saint. Uh, yes. kind yeah, of. I yeah. mean, he was a saint so, or a, of sex. So uh, you're right. I think probably Pecker was the first time it reared its ugly head again. Um, when was the last time you like went to church? What's the what's you, your what's I, your current I, I church going go experience? I had to go to my mother's funeral in that church that I refused to take the Legion of Decency pledge mm -hmm. when I was eight, and it was the first thing my mother remembers me rebelling. I said, "What do you mean you're not going to take it? I'm not doing that." Uh, oh, you mean go to church? I don't go to defy it. You know, sure, I don't go yeah, in and yeah. No, I just mean, like, what was your last, last like experience Shri in a church? Shout out you know? like Latin masses yeah, only, yeah. right? Um, the last time I was in a church was at my mother's funeral, and uh, it made me uneasy. Well, my mother died; that made me uneasy enough. But having to deal, being in there again, gave me the creeps. Uh, and that was the first time since child. I mean, did you you went regularly as a child? I'm assuming. No, I didn't go to Catholic. Yeah, every Sunday we sure. went. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And then I would then say, oh, I want to sit with Mary Vivian Pierce because she, our parents were friends, and then we would just leave and go out and smoke cigarettes and stuff, and then come back right when it was over and go home. And um, so, and then I in grade school I didn't go to Catholic school, so they went to Sunday school and the nuns there knew that your parents didn't send you to Catholic school so they were really hateful and they read us all the movies we go to hell every week the condemned oh, yeah, list which was so ridiculous sure, yeah, fact, we were eight years old how could we go to see mom and dad how could we ever go downtown to see love is my profession you know so um that made a big influence on me. And I used to clip the condemned list and read it over and over. I could recite it practically. And Baby Doll, that was the first oh, one yeah, they really yeah, told us we would go to hell to see. And Edith Massey in Pink Flamingos is a direct result of that in the playpen. Uh, yeah, I actually saw Catherine Breya introduce Baby Doll. Yeah, she's great. Ago. I'm a big fan yeah. of hers, too. Um, yes, well, Baby Doll, uh, remember, look at Carol Baker's book, and it has the pictures. There was a billboard of her in that crib that was the length of Times Square. I mean, it's really shocking to yeah, imagine yeah. what that did then, that in the crib sucking his own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and, and if you see Baby Doll Day, it's very arty. Oh, it's, Baby it's Doll's great, incredible, yeah, but for it's, sure. It's hardly sensational as far as like. Oh sure, but I think it has it has an R rating right now, doesn't it? Weirdly, Probably, I think you yeah. buy it. Well, and it's it has got Well, they were saying because she wouldn't have sex with her husband, she held it back. Yeah. Like yeah, that's yeah. even worse than having sex if you're a woman. Sure, but all that sort of like there's a there's a wave of Tennessee Williams oh, films I love that, Tennessee I'm, Williams. that I'm pretty. You know, I, mean, I wrote about him in my book. I yeah. wrote the introduction. Yeah, to his yeah memoirs. I mean, Boom. I know you're a fan yeah, of. I'm a huge so, Boom fan yeah, as like, well. Like bad Tennessee Williams is good too. Sure, sure. Well, gets to misbehave. What else exists of that Baltimore, if anything? If you were well, if you were I'll to give what, a walking tour of, of multiple Well, England where lives. I lived in that apartment is still there, and out front it looks exactly the same. It's the same apartment that Mary Vivian Pierce walks out of in the beginning of Mondo Trasho. And it was, uh, we lived on the second and third floor, and you had to walk through a plumbing school that was where they were in there working on pipes, and Divine would walk through and drag through it, and they would just stare. And it still looks exactly the same from the outside. I tried to go in it once, and the, a guy answered the door, an old guy, and said, you don't want to come in here. And it was, I think, kind of like a really seedy, like, rooming house. It, it wasn't when we lived there. It was fine. I thought it was a lovely apartment. Although, one of the women that lived with us had a breakdown, and her mother came to get her stuff and said to me, I knew she was living badly. I never knew it was this bad. And I thought, what do you mean? It was a absolutely lovely apartment. The one that you saw in the movie. Sure, yeah, yeah. That was a duplex. It was two floors. That uh, was fine. And where did you get all those posters from? Probably in the, in the art cinema in Provincetown, the guy would give them to me. That's probably where I get them, and I, where I used to four-wall the theater, and Just he would give them done. to me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and speaking of four-walling, what was the... What was it like getting this movie out into the world, which really has no sort of commercial yeah. <laughs> prospects whatsoever? Um, I would forewell the place, and and you know, technically, I would have owed, could have lost a lot of money. I mean, in the, even in Provincetown, like let's say if he got, let's say it was two dollar mission, and and his cut was a dollar, I had to pay him for every seat in the house, and if nobody came, I would have owed him money. But we always sold out because. I worked in the Provincetown bookshop and they let me turn the windows into like Times Square, mm -hmm. like big pictures of Divine and everything. And we gave out flyers on the street. Mary Vivian Pierce lived there, Divine lived there. So David Lockery lived there. So we were in town. And after it played there, I played at the movies, which was across the street where Dennis Dermody, who's the film critic, ran it as a kid. And so we always played there more than anywhere, really, Provincetown. And what were those audiences like? The audiences were still what my audiences are, people that don't fit in quite with their other minorities but are, have a good sense of humor, kind of pissed but funny and not... I don't know. My audiences... I always had an audience. I'm not saying it was wide, but when we had those premieres, it would sell out. Uh, so I never had couldn't find an audience. Somebody understood them. I didn't get a good review for 10 years, really. I um, almost never got good reviews, but it was a very different time where there was a cultural war. So the the critics that would give us the bad reviews rose to the bait so much that we would take all the ads. I think I was one of the first ones that had an ad campaign based on negative reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a septic tank explosion. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great one, yeah. Do you feel like you learned something from making multiple maniacs and then took that and applied it to pink flamingos hopefully like, there... i learned that if you ever think you should cut something you should uh every a joke is there's no such thing as a long good joke um sure each time i learned a little more i think um i i especially learned what worked not and and tried to do it more with a sense of humor definitely sure it was like going each year was a year in film school i guess for somebody else everybody learned everybody we learned to do it by by making it rather and then they would have never let me make those movies in film school now they would yeah well it's also i mean also your early work sort of strikes me as movies made by someone who wasn't waiting for permission to make a film no I we think, never you know, asked for permission i mean the thing was that's what I was watching today thinking there's almost no one on the street when we're out there doing that because we always would go Sunday morning yeah, that was yeah. the best time because people weren't out there but still we were in the city I mean you could look out the window and see that but um, and we were nervous about it too because we had been arrested in, in Mondo Trasher so that's why I shot on my parents front lawn in my apartment everywhere except the end and I saved that for the end in case <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. I don't remember even if the police ever even came that day. 
And there's a there's a guy in a police uniform. Well, film, that was right? we that uniform I had okay. that we had a, we rented it and never took it back and used it when we went on the road because I'd have an opening show where Divine and I would come out and then a fake cop would come in and try to arrest us and Divine would strangle him. That's real nice. Can you imagine that today? Uh, and that was our little opening act, our vaudeville, our our our, our Kroger Bab, you know, selling the uh, sex education equipment in the aisles. It was part of the show, actually. I mean, I didn't have, like, the Tingler used to have a nurse on duty, sure, or they yeah, used to have yeah. somebody, an ambulance sitting out front. I, I did, used all that kind of stuff. I mean, anything we could to jazz it up, we did. Um, what's your relationship like to the film now? Like when you watched it this morning to record the audio commentary? Well, I had seen it before because I watched it in Provincetown with an audience. Well, to me, I think the restoration is amazing. I think it does make it look new. It makes it look like, I said, a failed John Cassavetes yeah, sure, movie, yeah. but I mean that in a good way. Um, so I see it. I see things I would cut. I see things. But to me now, it maybe is worse as far as how people react to it. But I loved when I saw it for an audience the first time in Province Town with young people. And they seemed quite startled by it, actually. They were like, what the hell is this? You know. So I think I'm proud that I can, you know, almost 50 years later, still startle a young person. So I think it holds up. I, I think, and yeah. maybe it's even weirder because of the time capsule that you're seeing it in. You see a calendar right behind Edith in there that says November 1969. Yeah, so, yeah. and that was startling to me. I didn't ever see that until the until the uh, restored. I guess it was always there, but it was like, whoa, it's, it's yeah, like a. Yeah like a kidnapping thing where they show the people sure. holding the newspaper yeah, yeah. to pr prove it was really well, that person's alive. Yeah, that day. yeah. Well, and you also sort of break the fourth wall in a way by bringing the Manson murders but into that, it in a very direct When we way. shot that movie, they had not caught Manson. So the beginning was that Divine had tricked her husband into believing he committed the murders. Then halfway, more than halfway through it, the day that we filmed, or right before there, you see the shot where they look at the newspaper and say, Charles Manson, they even pronounce the names wrong. Who are these people? I never heard of these people. That's the day they caught him. Oh, wow. And I knew that, well, I guess we have to put that in because now, and it, he said, see, so I couldn't have done it. So I did a rewrite there when it happened. But even that day, we never thought for a minute that Charles, that person was going to become what he is or the you know, most notorious boogeyman in the history. It was just three blank names. I feel like I uh, grew up in Alexander, Virginia, and we go to Video Vault, which is mm -hmm. a video store there yep. that I ended, ended up working My sister at a few years there, later, yeah. uh, which uh, Lee Atwater actually helped start yes. that video store. Um, and I remember I had seen Serial Mom and Polyester, and I was about 14 years old. Um, and remember being like being in the video store with my dad and saying, "Oh, let's 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 try out let's try out Pink Flamingos." But let's... were you allowed to? I mean, your yeah. father was open to that. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he knew at mm -hmm. the time. Um, and I remember sitting sitting in my room because my room was where the TV was, uh, and we started watching it. We were actually fine for <laughs> most of the beginning, and then we got to the singing asshole scene. Yeah, and I just remember looking. <laughs> straight ahead <laughs> not at your father straight right. ahead and just saying i don't think i can watch this movie with you anymore yeah, Dad. Yeah. and he said that's okay <laughs> and then he left and i finished it uh by myself um did he ever ask to see the rest i don't think so <laughs> i think he was like that's fine that's yeah. for him let him well, that's a better it. reaction. When my mother saw the first one, I think, was Mondo Treasure, and she said, you're going to die in a mental institution, commit suicide or OD. I said, oh, you liked it. <laughs> but they sort of got used. They never saw it. It's the only one they never saw was Multiple Maniacs. And I'm glad they didn't see it. Why well, put them through? Sure. That, that sure. would be torture for most sure. any parent. Sure. Really, even today. Um, but yeah, discovering Multiple Maniacs sort of as a kid, it it, it really still has this energy to it that watching it even a few weeks later is feels very like palpable like it feels like an early it feels like like an early Fassbender film in a well, way or a like a compliment. or like an early you know or like an early Cassavetes movie yeah. there's there's sort of an energy to it well it's I also is... about an outlaw gang on the run yeah, so when sure. you're young that's always interesting yeah, that's yeah. always exciting yeah, to be yeah. outlaws on the run no matter what you're an outlaw against um well there's a line from uh Cecil B. Demented that I also think about pretty frequently which is uh 
technique is nothing more than failed style. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I believe I think, that. I think this is sort of a testament to that, it is, too. Because if you come out of a movie and the first thing you say is that cinematography was really good, I think that's a bad movie. Yeah. I, yeah, even, yeah. Maybe if you're, who's the one, Tree of Life? <laughs> sure, sure. But <laughs> so I actually of, like his movies. Have, but have you seen the two, the yes, two most recent ones? I like Do you them. like those as well? Yeah, I did. But I could see where everybody would think I would really sure. hate them. Yeah, I could yeah. see really hate. It's close whether I love them or hate them. Yeah, but I love them. What What do you think you're responding to? Then? I'm responding to the there's <laughs> actors and they don't say one thing. Sure, yeah, he has to totally. pay movie star yeah, salaries totally. to people and they're not even in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like him only because he's so maddening, and obviously he does not take notes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> because well, again, yeah, someone who someone who is they very can't clearly just money. doing their own yeah, thing. They can't. Yeah. I don't know. I I think that they get that he has turned pretension, something I usually hate, into a great talent. Sure. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. Arguable. I know. I Arguable. understand that you could argue. That yeah. I mean, point. I think what yeah. you what you just said about what you like about them is liter. I described, I think, to the wonder to someone as it's a movie of people literally walking places and yeah. not getting anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I liked um, it. I like that one. I know that was the last one, right? Uh, no, the last one what was, was the, last the one? Christian Bale one. Yeah, but what was it um, called? It was I saw called it called A Night of Cups. Yeah, but what's it about? I don't remember. Christian Bale is like a disgruntled screenwriter. Oh, that's right. And he just right. sort of wanders that's around, right around Los LA. Angeles. Oh, it's his L.A. movie. Did you it's ever see The LA New Age? Movie. No. Uh-uh. What's The New Age? It's one? not by him. I forget who it's by, but it is <laughs> just, just being in Los Angeles and the worst kind of around the worst rich people. It's really good. I... Uh... <laughs> I really enjoyed Maps to the Stars, the oh, Cronenberg me too. I film. I love that movie. I thought it was yeah. sort of... Well, I love Bruce Wagner's one of my oh, favorite yeah, writers. For sure. He's great, great, great. But that was like an especially It was icky really good. Portrait. I picked that as my favorite movie of the year in art form. I thought it was great. Yeah. What What have you seen this year so far? That you've I really like Tickled. And I liked, oh, yeah, Tickled. And I like Wiener Dog. There's mm-hmm. a lot I liked. Yeah. Um, cool. How Jerry? about you? What have you liked this year? Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm really into this movie called The Love Witch. Have you? No, I haven't seen heard it. Heard of that? Are I've you aware heard of it, of it, but tell me what it is. It's this woman, Anna Biller, who made a film called Viva a few mm-hmm. years ago. She shot it on 35 millimeter. She built all the sets herself. She mm-hmm. designed all the costumes. And the from love, where? Uh, she's uh, on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. She's in L.A., I think, or San Francisco, maybe. Um, but it's done in the style of like a lush sort of Technicolor melodrama, and it has a little bit of like a beyond the valley of the dolls Mm -hmm. vibe to it um but she uses those sort of archetypes to make this sort of very radical uh feminist film no that Um, sounds good it's really phenomenal um i'm sort of over the moon about it and she finished it on 35 millimeter but it's it's come out it's come out oscilloscope is releasing it okay um and but it hasn't come out yet has not come out yet oh okay i'll keep my eye yeah i think it comes out in the fall um and it has, it's like full of things that shouldn't work in movies, but like somehow magically do. Yeah, that's um, always good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like every scene is the characters walking into a room and saying like, hello to each other. You're like, hi, what are you doing here? Da, 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 da. There's like a scene that ends with two characters talking about what they're going to have on their sandwich. Mm-hmm. It's like really special. Well, if um, you can make it special, that's great. That's yeah. what I mean. It's... But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the print she has is absolutely beautiful i'll keep my eye yeah. peered yeah totally oh do you want to know a fun fact i have a fun fact for yeah. you you have a christmas tree ornament that my ex-girlfriend and i made for you on your tree and which is it it's the it's dorothy malone and jane mansfield and joan crawford as the manson oh, yeah, girls yeah, yeah, on one yeah, side God, yeah. and on the other side it's don knotts as charles manson yeah, yeah oh god how do you know i have it in a picture yeah so we so i made this movie white reindeer which yeah, is yeah, a, yeah, which, is a, yeah, which yeah. is a christmas yeah. film um and uh, i mean we made that for you 12 13 years oh, ago god. it was our it was our christmas present from her mother one but year but where did you see it in a picture i saw in it on house? a picture yeah because the sun paper did all my christmas yes. decorations yeah, and year. it probably showed us yeah we had it that year it was the year i I was in Los Angeles for the um, L.A. premiere of White Reindeer. And mm-hmm. just that morning was just like on Facebook or something. And someone would post that. And I was like, oh, I'll take a look. And then I was like, oh, there's that ornament. <laughs> I know. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Um, Annually coming out every year. And, you know, Dorothy Malone, I think she's still alive. But yeah? you don't hear anything. And I went to visit her. I met her. Mm-hmm. 
now it's 15, 20 years ago. And even then, she was kind of a recluse, and I always met her. I met her at the Dallas Country Club where I walked in, and she was at a table alone with a big picture hat. I loved Dorothy Malone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I don't know. She she lived in a car that seemed like all her stuff was in it. But I don't know if she lived there, but she looked like a movie star, but when I walked her to the car, she definitely seemed to have a little hoarding in the Uh, car, definitely. Um, when the Lincoln Center did their Cirque retrospective a few years ago, did she come? No, no. They asked, but they asked me to cut the trailer for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I remember I was sort of looking through, pulling stuff uh, from all the films, and I pulled uh, the scene of her in "Written on the Wind" by the lake, where she's mm-hmm. sort of emoting, and the voiceover is happening. Yep. Um, and then watched it in cutting the trailer without the voiceover in it Mm -hmm. and it became this new sort of really magical thing i never i never quite saw an actor from an old film acting in a way that i did when i watched that shot of dorothy malone just sort of by the tree without without hearing her inner monologue well i would say you turn off the sound for a movie you can see how it's made always i met um douglas sir how is that? With Fassbender. How is the that? The two of them together at the Berlin Film. I almost fell to my knees. And he had on a white suit, like such an elegant Cirque gentleman. Cirque or and, Fassbender? And, no, Cirque. And Fassbender looked like such a hog. Sure. Right? And they showed me, they made a movie together, you know, mm-hmm. with 15 minutes. And I don't know that it's ever been shown here. It's a Tennessee Williams short story. Cirque directed it and Fassbender's per, yeah, in it. Bourbon you saw Street it? Blues. Yeah, yes. I've seen it. Yeah. But I saw it. It was in German. They showed it to me, but I couldn't understand it. But... um so yes, I did meet them, which was a great That's memory. That's crazy. Great do, memory. do you remember anything at either of no, them they said were, to you? He told me, Cirque told me he liked Pink Flamingos, which I find really hard believing <laughs> sure. that he could have liked sure. it. And Fassbinder, I met him a couple times. He always pretended he couldn't speak English, so you complimented him that he spoke great English. Yeah, yeah. But I'm a huge fan of Fassbinder and miss him the most of all the yeah, ones. Yeah, of course. Yeah. When did you first see those Fassbender films? Oh, God. I remember the first one I saw was the one where they sit on the... Castlemacher, yeah. 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 And where why does air are... I love that one, too. I I loved all of them. I saw them right in the middle. Fox and the Friends, I love that. So I saw them... I don't know where I saw them. Probably in New York, because they showed them. The New York Film Festival did them first, and then they would open here. And Cookie Muller was his Coke dealer. So he would always come over to buy Coke from Cookie when he was in town. Amazing. Amazing. And what about Cirque? When, do you, when did you first see those films? Um, well, I think I probably saw one of them in the 50s without any knowledge about film. or Because Fassbinder really did make him famous again. He really did. And so then I saw him all around that time and was completely, you know, as every other filmmaker in the world did, loved him. Uh, that deer to the window, you know, every day yeah. of my oh, life. Yeah, of course. You yeah, can't yeah. really top that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a personal favorite? Do you have one you return to? I, I think of all of them, the credits to Written on the Wind are the most amazing. And and maybe All That Heaven Allows, I think, is my yeah. favorite one. I mean, All That Heaven Allows, I always say, is like, it's not a movie about Christmas, but when it is, it's the best Christmas yes, movie I've yeah, ever seen. Yeah, it's so good. Um, and- yeah, no, it's, I mean, for when I was making White Reindeer, that was a huge, that was a huge, yeah. huge influence. And um, Tarnished Angel. I mean, I I even yeah. saw Hitler's Mad Men. Oh, yeah, no, I just recently saw that. Where they all go out the, the and the ghosts go up in the air. It's yeah, yeah. It's the one out. where Fred McMurray works in the toy store and he meets Barbara Stanwyck again. Mm-hmm. There's always yeah, Tomorrow. Yeah, I saw that there's one, but I forget tomorrow. the name. What is that one called? It's, there's That's always not the tomorrow. Tarnished Angel. There's always Tomorrow. There's always Tomorrow. That's a great, yeah, it is. great I mean, title, yeah. too. They all have these sort of very lush studio titles yeah. from that era that sort of, pro- yeah, again, promise things, but when he delivers... A woman's his... picture. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I know. <laughs> of course. Well, and you've also mostly made films with female protagonists, Oh, my female characters too. are much better than the male ones. Sure. Yeah. Is there, do you, do you, is there a reason why you feel like you maybe, gravitate towards writing maybe for women? I'm gay. I don't know. Sure. I mean, I don't know if the answer to that, but they are stronger than the characters, even if a man plays them. Yeah, yeah. No, of course. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Except, well, Johnny Depp. I think because when Divine died, sure, yes. I thought, yeah, yeah. what am I going to do? And I could not replace. So I went with Johnny Depp, the complete opposite, kind of a male movie star. But at the same time, one that I think I made the right decision. I mean, he was Justin Bieber at that time in yeah. his life, basically, yeah, yeah. and hated it, though. Yeah. I think Justin's starting to hate it. Sure. Um, when you met Justin Bieber. I did. He drew my mustache. I'm a fan of Justin. Yeah. Do you have a favorite song? No, no, that's in my book. Okay, I gotta, I I'm okay. writing about Justin. All right. right. I won't ask you anymore <laughs> about Justin Bieber. I think that's everything I have. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank I you really very much. It. You were very well prepared. Mm-hmm.
This is Nick Dawson from Talk House Film, and you've been listening to Zach Clark and John Waters on the Talk House Film podcast. This episode was engineered and edited by Talk House podcast producer Elia Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to Talk House Film and Talk House Music Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can.